This is Harvesters Online Service. And anywhere you're watching from, anywhere you are in the world, you are welcome. We're so blessed that you are here. I got a question, you know, I got a question on social media. And the question is this. It says that, um, I really feel I should start a business, but I've been really afraid. And this is taking me one year. Every time I want to take a step, things just seem to go wrong. How do I deal with fear? That's great. You know, the truth is that sometimes every one of us has this kind of notion. The first thing is this. You need to cut off the fear feeder. The way faith comes by hearing, fear also comes by hearing. Cut off the people, the places that fits this fear. The second thing you also have to do is this. You need to be very wise and strategic. I will ask you that you should get someone that's done this before and ask them questions and get them involved and build a plan. The last thing I will say is this. Go to God's Word and find three scriptures that you can really sink your face into that will build up faith. One of them is in Deuteronomy 28 verse 12. It says, I will bless the works of your hand. Another one is Psalm chapter 1. It says that um, you will bear your fruit in season. You know, whatsoever you do will prosper. As you begin to meditate, the fear will begin to dissolve. When faith walks in, fear walks out. Glory to God. Glory to God. If today is your first time, thank you for joining us today. My name is Bolaji Deo, and I'm the pastor at Harvesters. I've, you know, I've been privileged to pastor people for many years, helping them be what God wants them to be, discover their purpose in life, and fulfill it. I want to send in an email. If today is your first time, if you do not mind, I want to connect with you. Just link up me on social media. Let me know how you are and where you're connecting from. Today, um, today um, we will receive our givings first. Someone says, why are we doing that? Part of our Christian worship is the fact that we give. There's a testimony I would love to read to you. There's a testimony I would love to read to you from here. And very, very touching testimony. And this testimony is from, um, I mean, it, 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 it's an experience of someone in our church. My name is um, Priestley Michaels. I'm an entrepreneur. Um, last week of January, I lost businesses worth millions of naira in the fire incident on Lagos Island. Um, and I lost everything. My church harvesters came through for me and sent me and helped me financially with 250,000 naira and encouraged me with love and prayers. By his grace, I'm rising again. I sincerely appreciate the kindness and the support. Thank you so much, harvesters. Thank you so much, pastors. I'm so grateful. You know, one of the things you need to understand is this. When we're giving our tithes and offerings, one of the things we do is that out of this, we're able to help people. You're helping someone that can go hungry tonight. There's an hungry child that will have a meal just because you're giving. There's someone that's lost everything during this season that you're supporting. We even have an end hunger campaign going on today. And the Bible says something very powerful as we help people. The Bible says, he that gives to the poor lends unto God and God will repay back. So as you give in your fight, as you give in your offering today, I want to encourage you, believe that the payment of God is going to come to you because you are helping people that cannot help themselves. Let's go ahead and pray together today. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ today, we bring our tithes and offerings to you because you are good, because you are kind, because you are faithful. We honor you. It's a tough season for most people financially, but you've been good to us. We have to give. And as we give today, I'm asking, Lord, and this giving is helping people that are not strong, people that are poor, people that are going through distress. I'm asking in the name of Jesus Christ that you bless everyone giving in return. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor, for just receiving our titan offerings. And I want to say to you quickly here, if, um, if you're watching online, the account details are right there on the screen. You can go ahead and do a transfer. If you're watching outside the country, I want to give it to you, any of your cards. You can go to the website and just, you know, you know, type it in. It's a secured platform and go ahead and give. All I know is this, that our giving is a result of our faith. Some people withhold because of fear, which is dangerous. But we are moving forward and giving because of faith. All right. This morning, I will be... This morning, it could be evening where you are. I'm talking about overcoming stagnation and financial loss. I really think, let me tell you something. I really think this is one of the best messages I would ever preach. I preached so far, rather. Will you turn your Bible to 2 Kings chapter 4 in verse 1? So I want to tell you a, a, you know, a, a story. When I got born again as a, as, as a, young, as a younger person, as a child, um, I belonged to a Christian set that was mostly poor people. In the church I used to attend, we thought that poverty was something that God wanted. That was what we believed. And we enjoyed it. It, it was, you know, we, we, were, we were not allowed to watch televisions. So we could not have any kind of jewelry. And that was wonderful. 
over time, I found out truth of God's word, and I found that was extreme. So I moved over to, you know, another church, more word of faith, more Bible-believing, Pentecostal, charismatic, and, you know, we got going. You know, and you know the amazing thing is this. In the older church I was, the belief was that God doesn't want to prosper, so people did not have high expectation of prosperity. But in this newer church, they really believed that God wanted you to prosper. They would teach so much about fighting, so much about offering, so much about how God wants you blessed. But I want to be very sincere with you. In my time in that place, I really thought this thing is confusing. You say, God wants me to prosper, but a lot of people are struggling financially. And as I talk about overcoming stagnation and financial loss today, I want to speak into something important, an important subject. Why do many Christians struggle financially? Most times when I hear of people that are doing great in finances, most of them are not Christians. Most of them are not people that even, they, they could go to church, but they are not like very vibrant Christians. Most of the time when you see vibrant Christians, they seem to be average. They seem to be regular. They seem to be just to people that have all the financial problems. So the question is this, especially when you hear teachings like, if you're faithful in prayer, if you're faithful in giving, if you're serving the Lord, you'll prosper. And you look back and people are not prospering. Because of the season we're in right now, a lot of people are challenged and many Christians are challenged. So the question is this, is it that we have been scammed, you know? When I go online and I see all the hatred against churches, against pastors, you know what I noticed? I noticed that most of the drivers of those conversations were once very committed Christians. And when you read their story, they will really reveal to you that they actually felt scammed. They felt as if they deceived us. It's, they didn't tell us the truth. And the reason is this, there's something they preach, but the experience is actually contrary. So they say, they say, if I pray and serve and give, I'll be financially buoyant and blessed. But they look at their life, I've given so much and there's nothing to show for it. So they think it's a scam. So they go from that position of believing in God and they move to another position. And you know, and you know, I wish I could say that this is not the reality, but that's what I've noticed. Let's turn to 2 Kings chapter 4 and let's read from verse 1. The Bible says, and there was a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophet. So this woman, her husband was a prophet. Because the sons of the prophet was a technology to refer to the other prophet that were not the senior prophets. And the woman came unto Elisha and said, thy servant, my husband. See, you need to notice the woman came crying. It was not an easy conversation. This woman was crying. This woman was crying. This woman was crying. And she said this. He says, my servant, thy husband. He said, thy servant, my husband is dead. And you know that thy servant did fear the Lord. And the, he says, you know, question, why does she begin to say this? And you, you will understand because imagine this woman is really crying. This woman is really embarrassed. And she says, number one, and as she's sobbing, and she, she, she can hold her words and her tears are breaking out. And it's difficult to express herself. The few words that come out is this. My husband, your servant, that means he served you. The prophet, he was a prophet, is dead. What was she saying? She was saying, our financial hope is gone. Do, do you know what it means when you get to a place that you call your office and they say because of the current recession, we are retrenching people. When you get that kind of letter, the first thing that flashes on your mind is the children's school face. How will I be able to afford it? The thing that strikes on your mind is, what am I going to tell my wife? And this woman was crying. And she was crying just because the man that would have been the financial pillar in the house was gone. But to make matters worse, she says, you know, that servant feared the Lord. She was really saying that, hey, 
Elisha, tell me something. I don't know why this is happening. If there's soul that should be blessed, it should be my husband. It should be our family because we are faithful people. We are the one that turn in, in church on Sundays. We are the one that come for midweek services. We are the one that come for prayer meetings. We are the one that carry the chairs. If people are tidy consistently, we are the tightest. If people are supporting other people, other projects in church, we are the ones that serve and fear the Lord. Have you ever got to the place that some things happen in your life and you're look up to God and say, God, that should not be me. That could have been any other person, not me. You walk into a contract and you almost had the papers, everything all sealed at the last junction after you prayed the special prayer, after the prophecy came through, after you sown the special seed. They say, we're sorry, but we've cancelled. Oh, oh. And you feel, that should not be me. This woman said, that, is it Elisha, you know this. Prophet, you know, is it, that, is, it, is it thy servant fear the Lord? Do you know what it means when they say people cannot have babies and all your friends, when you were still keeping yourself as a virgin, they were having three or four abortions, sleeping with five or ten men and they'll get pregnant and have an abortion and get pregnant and have an abortion. And this is eight years after school and eight years after school, you have been married for Six years now, no child. They've been married for four years now. They have two, three kids. And you're going with God, that should not be me. You know what it feels like? When you serve God from the days of your youth, yet you're as broke as a church rat. Hello, you see the sister in the car? She looks so beautiful. Her name is Grace. You walk up to her, you say, hey, sister, I really, you know, and she looks at you and the look is like... <laughs> Do you really think you have something to match me as a life mate? And th that, that just paralyzes you. Do you know what it means to have so many ideas in your mind and there's no funding to, to push it and you have been declaring the word of God and declaring it and it just seems as if you're stuck. Do you know what it means when you have a company and you begin to owe salaries? You can tell we can pay this month but I can't tell next month. And you're wondering, will I fire them? But you can see their families in your mind. Overcoming stagnation. And financial loss. And this woman said, He said, Elisha, prophet, he said, My child, my husband is not only dead, my, my husband <laughs> didn't just fear the Lord. Meaning that she had a sense of disappointment, not just towards the prophet, it was towards God. Sometimes when you see the anger of social media against pastors and churches, the truth is this. Most of the people are angry against God. They can't just say it because they feel as if God let them down. And you know it. So you could be watching right now. And he said, she said, and the creditor, the person we owe money, He's come unto us to take my two sons to be born men. Do you imagine how poor they must have been? They must have been so poor, they don't have lands to use as collateral. They don't have cars to use as collateral. They don't have friends who were so poor, there were no other friends that could become guarantors. But they were so poor and hungry that when they took out loan, they had to use their own children. Think of how desperate they must have been think of how back you know how backward their life must have been and the thing i'm saying is this you must bear in mind that this were prophet this were followers of of, of of yahweh and why am i saying this to you because you can be a christian and have financial problems and there's nothing wrong with your christianity just that there's something wrong with your finances you can be a christian and find it difficult to get married you can be a Christian and find it hard to have a child. It, it, it can happen. And the question is, okay, I'm, 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 I feel stagnated. I think my mates have gone farther than me. I think I've been about this place for a long time. How can I get forward? I think I've gone through a lot of loss. How can I get forward? This is what I will say to you. And if that is where you are, this service is for you. If you know someone in that kind of situation, you have to get on your phone and call them and say, tune in and listen to this. And let me say this quickly. 
just before, before you think that this is only spiritual, because sometimes when people talk about stagnation, Christians are quick to say, you know, you know why is it happening to me? It's sometimes it's a universal concept. There's a story about a huge entrepreneur I read about. Hey, this is a story. I just summarized it. I've learned a lot in my 12 years of business. Practically nine years of that time was really starting and closing up one startup after another. But what I learned was this. I had to fail for 10 straight years to be prepared to scale a six-figure freelance business. So for 10 years, there seemed not to be no emotion because he just kept falling and coming down and falling and coming down. But at the end of the 12th year, he was running a, a, a business in dollars that had six figures. Sometimes you must know that entrepreneurship and life <laughs> is failure unavoidable entrepreneurship and life is what is failure unavoidable let me say that again entrepreneurship and life is failure unavoidable that's why most people you call success are those that have failed for a long time but refuse to give up overcoming stagnation and loss and the reason i'm saying so to you is that Maybe you lost you some money. Maybe you lost a job and you feel hopeless. You feel as if, why is this happening to me? Listen to me, calm down. It's not just you. You know, well, I read the story of Richard Branson and I, got, I heard I got into so much debt one time. The bank says, where is our money? He says, I have no money to pay you back. He says, what should we do? He said, borrow me some more money to get your money. I love the attitude. And, and the reason I'm saying so is this. So if I feel there's loss, if I feel there's stagnation, what do I do? The first thing is this. This is what I want you to think about loss and stagnation. Your life is a reflection of your thoughts and your financial state is a reflection of your mindset. So what does that mean? I cannot be stagnated on the outside if I'm not stagnated on the inside. You didn't hear that. I can be stagnated on the outside if I'm not stagnated on the inside. The reason why my life is not going forward on the outside is because something deep has happened on the inside. The problem is that most people try to fix root problem by treating the surface and that brings temporary relief. But if you don't fix root problem, you cannot have permanent results. This woman was frustrated. She said, things have gone wrong. Things have gone wrong. Listen, the inability for a Christian to manifest his inheritance in Christ is traceable to his belief system. The biggest, the biggest things you will have as a challenge is going to be not the challenge you go through physically, what goes on in your mind. So people say, okay, I, I have financial plans. What do I do? I have Pieces of what do I do? I want to say what, should, what, what, what I think the root of the problem is. Because I want to show you something. At the root of the financial problem, loss and stagnation, is a mentality that supports where you are and prevents you from going forward. Let's look at verse 2. The Bible says this. <laughs> this, woman was caught, this woman came crying to Elisha. And Elisha said to her, What shall I do for you? My God! What was Elisha saying? This is a very powerful principle. Eli the woman came crying because she felt helpless. Elijah said, what shall I do? What Elijah did was the first thing. He, she, he opened her mind. He said, you think it's over, but something can be done about it. The people that are going to break the loss they're going through right now and going to break the financial limit are those that, despite there's a recession, can see opportunities. He says, what shall I do for you? The second thing he said is this. He says, tell me, what hast thou in the house? Wow. Elisha all of a sudden did the second thing. The woman said, and look at the answer of the woman. And the woman said, thy handmaid has nothing, not anything in the house. Save your pot of oil. Elijah said, for me to help you, the way you're talking, your focus and mental attention is focused on what you don't have. For you to receive a financial expansion, you have to move your thinking from what you don't have to what you have. Listen to me, many people are stuck because they keep looking at what they don't have. Meanwhile, what you don't have is not going to take you to your next destination. What you, what you have and you despise or you look down on is where your future is. This woman says, I 
I have nothing out of the blues. He says, I have a pot of oil. She never imagined that the pot of oil could be the miracle. The reason I'm saying so is this. Many of you feel you're stuck. You're not stuck. There's something you have that can translate into your financial future. So I say, how do you know that? Because God is faithful. He will leave nobody without help. The challenge is this. What you have, most of the time you despise it. What you have, most of the time you look down on it. What you have, most of the time you don't regard it. The man did not regard it. And the reason why is that she's operating from a mental paradigm of scarcity. That's what it is. And that's why, see, once you have the wrong mindset, it affects your finance. How does it affect your finance? Let me tell you how it affects your finance. Look at this. Belief is going to affect your actions and your actions determine your growth or result. Are you hearing me? Your belief system will affect your actions and your action will affect your growth or what or your result. Why am I saying this to you? Your actions are going to align with your belief. Let me give you a good example. And the results of your life are the function of your action. Let me give you an example. So if your belief system is this, I cannot be rich as a teacher. How does it affect your action? You will not dream it. Because already you've told yourself, when you drive past the most expensive house, you'll be like, ah, oh, if I was not a teacher, I could have been rich. But I cannot be rich as a teacher. You know, the second thing to do that, you will not even try. You will not even try because you define how you can go, where you can go to. The third thing is that you will not even be fully invested. Watch this now. All these actions are going to result into failure. But the big thing is that is the belief that actually informs the action. The reason I'm saying so is this. The reason a lot of people try to fix their business problem, their financial problem, and it amounts to nothing is this. This is the reason why. Because all the actions they are trying to take is based on the premise of a belief that works against them. Is that, is that, is that not the reason why in Psalm 23 verse 5? You know what God says? God say, um, sorry, Psalms 20 verse 5 says, it says, you anoint my head with oil, my cup, my cup meaning my financial storage runs over. He says, there's a way that you're thinking, the anointing comes on your mind and it affects your financial capacity. If something's going to change, it's going to change your mind. He says, you anoint my head with oil. He said, my cup runs over. The same thing in Deuteronomy chapter 28, he says, God says, I will bless the works of your hand. What you must understand is this. The way the hand works, the hand does not work by themselves. The nerve works by nerves that receive sensors from the brain. So how does the hand work? It's the brain that sends signals to the hand. So when God says, I will bless the work of your hand, the blessing really rests upon your head and mentality. And in its working, the expression is the hand. So if you are going to change, it is going to change from your mind. It's going to change for your mind. So if you think in this season you can't make money, you are right. Because you said so. If you think that this is your best season, you are right. Because you said so. What I know is this. Whatever you believe will become your prophecy. If whatever I believe becomes my prophecy, why do I want to shortchange myself in life by choosing scarcity instead of choosing abundance? Why do I want to sustain myself in life by holding back instead of throwing myself in? You know what the Bible says? It says, blessed is she that believe it, for there shall be performance. Performance is not to everybody. Performance is to him that believe it. This is what the book of Job says. He says, when others say there's a cast down, he says, cast down. He says, you shall say there's a lifting up. Listen, I'm speaking to everyone that will believe and receive it. That this 2020, all of your goals will still happen. You know what I'm saying? So some people really believe the year is over. And that's why they are not putting in much. Because their mindset said it's a wasted year. No, 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 no. Even if it's a wasted year, God says in Joel, He says all the years, the lukewarm, huh? the locust and the caterpillar has eaten. He said, I will restore. Hallelujah. He said, I will restore. It's not eaten. It's going to be restored. You know the next thing your belief does? Your belief affects your affection. It affects what you feel. Have you ever eaten something like chicken that you never knew? And as you were eating it, after you finish eating, someone say, oh, I said, oh, this thing stinks nice and different. What kind of chicken is it? He said, it's not chicken, it's snake. Ah, 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 ah. Why are you vomiting? The reason why is that 
because there's a belief in your mind that should not be eating snake. So it changed the way you felt about it. Why am I saying this? Your belief affects the way you feel. If you feel negative about money, if you feel negative about success, it will make you uncomfortable about making decisions that will make you succeed. I'm going to explain that to you in a, cons- in a, in a moment. Many people I know have what I call, they carry money wounds. What are money wounds? Money wounds are painful experiences they've had as a result of endeavors to expand their financial capacity. They've lost money. They've been duped. You know, they've been ruined. They've been scammed. You know, things have gone wrong. They've been shamed. They've been disappointed. Most people do not deal with those money wounds. So much so that when they want to make money, their subconscious mind goes somewhere deep within them. And when they want to show themselves to an activity that will make money, it reminds them because the subconscious mind tries to protect them. It says, hey, don't invest. Don't take any risk. Why is he saying so? He's preventing them from an experience they've stored in their database as a painful experience. So many people, you find that they cannot advance a lot because within them, there are stores of negative experience. Not that they don't have, want money, but they, in their mind, they've associated pain, difficulty, something very terrible with making money, and that begins to affect them. And look at this woman. This woman, and all of this thinking is what I will call scarcity thinking. All of this thinking is what I will call negative money mentality. This woman came to Elisha and says, I have nothing. Do you know what? The oil she had, she had that oil when, the, when to take the loan from, what? from the creditors. Why didn't she use the oil then? This woman obviously was making terrible financial decisions. The reason why is this. Why did she wait until things get so bad before she spoke to Elisha? Some of you are in financial situations. Why are you not speaking to the right people? You know, broke people take advice from broke people. What do you expect? People say it's a recession. Things are going to go bad. I want to ask you a question. Do all the monies in the world disappear and move into space? No. What happens in recession is this. Monies from a certain sector moves to another sector. And you know what? I'm positioned in the new sector. Praise God. Hallelujah. 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 I'm positioned in the new sector. Believe affects how you feel. Let, let me tell you what. So when you feel... A certain way about money, what will happen? You will not naturally choose it. So most of you, you hear something, I don't want too much money. When someone talks like, what's the, what's the pain? There's a, there's a pain they're dealing with. You hear that, ah, you know, I'm careful with money. There's a pain. You see, all that caution is because there's an inherited pain that they're actually nursing. How do you know you have a negative money? Because, wh- wh- why am I saying this? The way you are going to change your financial fortune as an entrepreneur, the way your business is going to scale, the way you are going to break through financially is that before we begin to talk about the principles for exponential increase, you must understand that true financial breakthrough is going to come from within first. You are going to have to break in to break out. That's the truth. You are going to have to break in to break out. How do I know I have very bad or negative, negative, um, what do you call it, financial mentality? It, it, I, and we're learning from culture, from experience, from family, from friends. How do I know? I'll give you some signs. There's some symptoms of negative financial mentality. Number one, people that have negative financial mentality or they're nursing financial money wounds, they generally do not set goals financial goals. And when they set financial goals, they don't set specific goals. And when they set specific goals, they don't pursue their goals. You know why? They don't want to get hurt again. They come to church. Oh yeah, write, your, write a faith check. They'll write it somewhere. Put it, you know, they don't pursue because there was a time they pursued it. And listen, whatever you are not actively pursuing does not come to you. You have to look out for opportunity to get it. Glory to God. The second reason, the second sign you will know is this. When people have money wounds, you know what? They have no intentional financial plans. You know why they don't have that? Because just the process to sit down 
and talk about how to make the money and plan. It is such a painful process because of all the loss and shame and disappointment. So they don't have the financial plan. And you know you are the one I'm talking to. Let me say something to you. Um, I lost my mom, and that's one of the most painful experiences in my life. When people lose pe- their mothers, I have to kind of distance myself from some details because there's a way they will share that it will begin to hurt me. When people have gone through financial deprivation, losses, and disappointments, to prevent themselves from emotional hurt, they don't invest themselves into detailed financial planning so that they don't get into trouble. And that's why a lot of people that are run companies get into trouble. You know why? They are already hurt, they are carrying burden, and they don't want to be logical about it. All of their staff see this is the way to go. They can't see it because instead of them to sit down to think, they are fi- the money won't would allow them to think. I'm telling you, look at this. Elisha had been with them when the husband was alive, when the wife was alive, and the kids were not debtors. But they refused to come to Elisha. The reason is simple. They will not take certain decisions because of their belief system. The third thing is this. How do you know you have negative financial mentality? They don't take money loss as lessons. They take it as a fatal end. I've met people that when they talk about money, they keep talking about 15 years ago, they lost an amount of money. Let me say something to you. Something you must know. There's a law in life called the law of attrition. What's the law of attrition? You must shed wastes. That's it. That's why when you eat food, some must go to the toilet. There's nothing you consume totally and use 100%. It's the law of attrition. The same thing financially. There's no way you're going to do it. Some part of your investment will not come back the same way it went. And the reason I'm saying so is that those that have negative financial habits, they hold on to the losses. Those that have positive financial habits, they hold on to the positive experiences. And the negative experience they hold on to makes them afraid. I know people, there's a man that told me, he said, I will never need business again. I said, why? He said, ah, 14 years ago, this and this happened. And they think that the way to, to confront their faith to avoid it, you don't confront fear or solve fear by avoiding it. What you must understand is this, that failure was a lesson. So people that have negative financial mentality feel financial loss as what? As a, um, as a fatal end, those that have positive views as a lesson. The last one is this. They don't invest or give. Someone says, wow. You know why? The reason why they don't invest or give is this. There's a fundamental fear that the way to keep my money is to hold it. The, it's like that story in March about 25, the, the, the talents. The one that had one held on to it and dug it in the ground and hit it. You know why they don't want to invest? Because there's a fundamental fear. Ah! I will lose it. And this is a principle. When you hold on to what you have, you will lose it. The Bible says, except a seed falls to the ground and dies, it abides alone. The biggest financial decision you can take is that for you to go forward, you must be willing to take some risk. The risk can be a new financial venture, a new business venture, a new investment. And let me say this to you. So I say, if I lose the money, if you lose the money, you learn the lesson. You must understand that. If you lose the money, you learn the lesson. And if you are conscious that there's loss there, that would make you careful on how you invest. The same they don't give. They don't give. Why, why, because they feel as if once the money, either is investment or giving, if the money loses my hand, I'm finished. <laughs> and the Bible says, there's he that scatter it and yet increases it. There's he that with all that more that is meat and it, it tends towards poverty. Why does God ask us to give? God uses giving to train us. I'm telling you, God uses giving to train us. The reason why is that if you have the discipline of putting aside 10%, saving will be easy for you. But if you are not able to give God 10%, how can you save? Giving helps you develop a discipline. The second thing giving does is that giving breaks the power, the fear of financial loss. Because when you give, you don't know what happens. So that fear, that fear money has on you. For example, many of you have not been able to tithe. Many of you have not been able to give an offering, even today, even this month. And, and the reason why is that you're just afraid that where will the next one come from? The moment you choose to tithe or to give, that fear of loss comes off you. Because the truth is that in the greatest crisis, there is the greatest what opportunities. And this is the season when some of you must start positioning for opportunities. The third reason why God asks us to give this is because of the positive emotions that comes from giving. Oh my God. I, I, sometimes I'm in tears when I see someone that I help. 
that turned out very positive. I know what that does to me. That gives me some emotion. I told you how your belief affects your emotion. That gives some emotion that encourages me to give. And because I have that positive emotion towards finances, I'm able to attract finances. And the last thing is this. This is very powerful. Why God asks us to give? Because every time you give, if I'm giving this, every time you give, guess what? Every time I choose to give, the image on the inside of me is what? A hava, not someone in deficits. And like attracts light. Like. So if the image on the inside is someone that has, what happens to me? I begin to attract. Every time I want, but my aunt is empty, the image on the inside is that I need, so I attract more need. But every time I want to give because I have, what happens? The image on the inside is that I have, I begin to have. That was the principle of Jacob. God told Jacob, when the animals are meeting together, put an image beside them. They are going to conceive according to what they see. Your life is going to be the reflection of your dominant thought. If your most dominant thought are thoughts of what having and prosperity, you will begin to prosper that way. That's why you will notice, you know, in the olden days, they would tell women that are barren. They would say, go and get children and adopt children. The reason why is this. If you can just adopt children, there's a way it will affect your psychology, your metabolism, your emotions, and that your body will go into a natural state by itself where you can get pregnant. If you just begin to practice giving, your, it's going to affect your mind and body in such a way that you will just begin to develop ideas and concepts and businesses that will cause you to go ahead in leaps and bounds. Somebody say hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. Let me round up with this. So the question is that, okay, so why do Christians struggle? This is why Christians struggle. Christians struggle. This is why they struggle. I want to notice this. Although God can bless them, and God wants to bless them, they have a mentality. They have a mentality. What's the mentality? They have a mentality that does not allow God to bless them. God can bless them, but they don't have an abundance mentality. They have what? A poverty mentality. And you know what the Bible says in Luke chapter 5? God says, you don't put new wine in old wine skin. What God wants to do in your life is new. But guess what? God cannot put new wine in old wine skin. Listen to me. A lot of Christians have mentalities and mindsets that hinders them. Let me say it very practically here. You will never... See, let me, let me say never. Very rarely you will, will you see Christians that do deals in millions of dollars and billions of dollars. And they'll keep saying, they, I possess this, I possess this, I po-. Listen, you can't possess by talking. Ah, you have to be practical. You have to be practical. A Christian will produce a product or service and it will look so embarrassing. The reason why is that the mentality cannot even comprehend what heaven has. Because if you understand what heaven is, the packaging of your product should not be so useless. So the major reason why Christians struggle is this. It's not because God is not faithful. It's not because giving is working. Giving is working because as we give God honors to see, the challenge that our mindset seem to be so negative, so scarcity conscious, we're not able to give ourselves. So the prosperity on the inside is not able to flow out because of what? Because of the scarcity mentality. Glory to God. I, I decree. Whatever mindset has held you down financially, held your business down, held your marriage down, it's falling off you today in the name of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. So the question is the fact that, okay, if my finance of my life is going to change, if I'm going to move from loss into profit, if I'm going to break stagnation, I must change my thinking. How do I change my thinking? The way you change your thinking is this. You have to reprogram your mind. Your spirit is perfect and powerful, but you have to program your mind. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18. Look at that. See what it says. It says, But we all with open faces be all as in the glass, the glory of God. We are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even by Christ Jesus. What's he saying here? He says, When I look at myself, I, I, you know, when I look at the mirror of God's word, what's the mirror? James 1 tells us that the mirror is the word. So bring my mirror, sir. Look at this. Can you lift it like this way? Maybe this way. Maybe this way. Yeah. Yeah. When I look into the mirror of God's word, you know what? 
every <laughs> what you see in the mirror the term is determined by the type of mirror it is if you look in the magnifying mirror you look bigger if you look in the concave, convex or convex mirror, it changes. But if you look into the mirror of the Word of God, the Bible says the mirror of the Word of God is the perfect mirror. The perfect mirror does not show you who you are. The perfect mirror shows you who He has made you to be. Praise God. So if you are broke, when you look at the mirror, you don't see yourself broke. If you are weak, when you look at the mirror, you don't see yourself weak. You see yourself the way God sees you. How does God see you? God sees you blessed. God sees you prospering. God sees you victorious. He says, so what do I do? He says, as we look at the mirror, hallelujah, raise up the mirror for me, sir. He says, as we look at the mirror, what happens? He says, as we look at the mirror, the more we study the Word of God, the more we devote ourselves to the Word of God. He says, we are transformed into the same image. Thank you, sir. You can, you can go back. Thank you, sir. You want your finance to change? The answer is the mirror. You will go to the Bible. Listen, you already have culture and programming that programs you towards poverty. You go to the Bible. You begin to read what it means that I'm, I'm, I'm like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bears the fruit in season. When that light dawns on you, your mind will break out. I'm, uh, this, what I just told you, <laughs> what I'm just told is not that you read though. This is what you do. It's a prayerful study. Why is it a prayerful study? You are praying for revelation. What is revelation? Revelation will do three things. When the word of God is light, when it comes, it will reveal negativity. So it will show you the mindset that holds you down. That's the first thing. Number two, it's light. It will reveal to you treasure. There are dimensions and ideas that are inside that you cannot see. So it will reveal to you. And the third thing is that the Word of God will give you direction. As you begin to study the Word of God, and this is not the regular study, I say, Father, no, no, no. This is a very prayerful study. It can last for a period. You're going to intense fasting and praying. Lord, how do I come out of it? How do I scale? How do I move ahead? As you are doing that one, two, three, four days, what will happen? The light will shine and that's it. I, I heard this testimony from Bishop Wedeko. Bishop said that he had heard about prosperity but he had never experienced it before. He took a book by Gloria Copeland, God's will is prosperity. And it went for three days fasting and prayer. He said when he was done reading this book, he was still as poor as he was when he read the book. He shouted and said, I will never be poor again. Nothing had changed. The only thing that changed that light has done on the spirit. Hallelujah. He said, as we behold, you know the challenge? You have no challenge. You're looking at the wrong thing. Hey, look at the word. You've looked at BBC enough. You looked at NDCD enough. It's time to look at the word. What does the word say? He says, as we behold. He says, as we behold. What are you beholding? Hallelujah. That's why. Listen, from tomorrow, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, as we fast and pray. Hallelujah. Revelations will bubble in our spirit everywhere. Fire will be stirred up by the power of the Holy Spirit. We are not like other people. Don't be deceived. We may look like them, but we're different. Oh, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. He says, all things are possible unto me. This is my reality. This is my confession. This is my paradigm. This is my perspective. This is what I choose to believe. You may choose what you believe, but I believe all things are possible because I'm a believer. Let's pray. And if you're not born again, can I start with that? If you're not born again, will you please say this prayer? Lord Jesus, thank you for today. I believe the message of salvation. I believe that Jesus Christ died and raised from the dead for my sake. Today, I receive eternal life into my spirit. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. And I'm declaring in this season that going forward, making progress in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.